Let's examine the driving force for reactions that we're looking at. And this is important to consider because when we're drawing a mechanism, it would be good if that mechanism seems reasonable or we can identify whether a reaction is likely to take place. So, when we're examining organic chemistry reactions, or this would apply to many other reactions types too, in organic reactions, but specifically we're looking at organic, we want to favor greater charge stabilization in our products so that um, those charges can contribute quite a bit to whether a reaction can happen. Now this isn't to say that reactions uh, cannot happen where a charge is generated, it's just that it's not as favored as one that it will create a better charge stabilization. And then the other major thing that comes into play is a greater total bond energy in the products when we're comparing it to the reactants. So between these two things, we're really just looking at, you know, a negative delta H. Both of these will um, contribute towards that goal. Now, there are other things that can drive chemical reactions forward, such as an increase in entropy, which is ultimately what is making a chemical reaction happen. But uh, a lot of organic reactions don't have that as the major driving force, unless you're evolving a gas or something as, as part of the reaction. So these come into play more often. So let's examine something where a greater charge stabilization is helping us towards the products. And uh, we need to look no further than a simple coordination reaction to, uh, as an example. So here we'll pick a bromine that has a negative charge on it, and then we'll select a carbocation right here. Now this is a tertiary carbocation, so it's a little bit more stable than its other counterparts, but if we were to take this negative charge and uh, combine it or coordinate it with our carbocation, then we would have no charges left in our product. And we would also generated a new sigma bond right here. And so both of these driving forces are at play. And so this reaction should be fairly favored. There's no charges left, where over here there were two charges. And there's a new bond. So this is definitely favorable. Let's look at another reaction. Here we're going to look at an E2 mechanism. So we'll have a, a base, which has a charge there. And then we'll have to have some substrate. We'll have our leaving group as a chloride. Now, when this comes in, we'll have our negative charge attack that proton. These electrons will then go here to form a double bond there. And that sigma bond right here will break. Now, let's look at the products that we're making. Well, we're making water. And we're making ethene. has a double bond there, and we're making a chloride. Now let's look at the uh, total bond energy uh, changes between these two sides, right? So over here we have broken a sigma bond between the carbon and a hydrogen, and we've broken a sigma bond between the carbon and the chloride. We've made a pi bond between these two carbons, 
and we've made a sigma bond between hydrogen and oxygen right here. So we have broken two bonds. Broken two sigma bonds. And over here we made a, a new sigma bond and we made a new pi bond. Now, pi bonds are generally weaker than sigma bonds. And so the total bond energy on this side is probably less than the total bond energy over on this, uh, our reactant side. So that's kind of a negative for this reaction going forward. But this reaction does happen and it is favorable. So what's coming into play here is that this chloride has a better charge stabilization than the hydroxide does. And so that's enough to overcome uh, the small energy difference between the bonds on the reactant side and the product side. Now, just because it looks like a reaction may not happen uh, doesn't mean it, it can't, right? So it's possible for this to break apart and go back to its reactants under the right conditions. And sometimes drawing things like we're doing right here uh, is a bit misleading, especially when uh, we haven't drawn any of the solvents or any of the other molecules or things that are in the solution. So we might not be getting a full picture So even though we said, hey, this reaction is favorable for coordination, this reaction does, or this can, perform heterolysis. And there could be other things contributing to that reaction's favorability. One of the big things that can happen is a, a solvent uh, effect. So if we have a solvent that could stabilize one of these charges, um, that can help. The other thing that will help is this is often not the end of the reaction. We'll probably be making a new sigma bond here or doing something else with this charge or, or maybe we'll be precipitating the bromide as a, as a silver uh, bromide salt. Something else can drive the reaction forward. There's also a slight contribution to entropy because we've made two objects here rather than one. And of course that is detrimental in, in this case, but um, in general, delta H seems to be a bigger effect than entropy does. But uh, the main point here being that there are other things at play. So don't just consider um, oh, this reaction won't happen because the charges are unstable and it's less bond energy over there. Um, this is not necessarily the end of the reaction. So one little step in the mechanism could be an energetic step. And, it, and indeed, this would probably be the rate determining step. That's the slowest step. But it can happen. The other thing that we need to watch out for is that just because something is a little bit more stable in the charge doesn't mean it will happen. And none of this explanation right here considers kinetics. And so if something is not happening, it may be kinetically unfavorable to happen. So that's just a little bit about the driving force for reactions and just things to watch for especially greater charge stabilization, and then also the total bond energy difference. These can help us when we're trying to think of, will this reaction happen, or is this reasonable um, for uh, this process to occur?